Hello everyone, this is Scott Roberts with Explore Scientific and my guest today is Howard Eskildson. And Howard is, uh, is a, I've been calling you a selenographer, okay, um, which I believe that you are. You know a lot about the moon. Um, I get daily images from you of uh, the sun and um, H-alpha and uh, calcium K and uh, white light, uh, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so anytime there's any action on the moon or the sun, which there hasn't been a lot of uh, for a while, um, uh, you know, you're there to catch it. Uh, but uh, uh, I met you originally, I think, with Tippy Dioria and Don Parker at a party in Florida. Um, so why don't we just get started with a little bit of an introduction from, of yourself. Howard. Okay. Um, the um, I've been interested in the sun, the moon, and the stars oh since grade school. Uh, I found a book one time that had constellations in it. And living in the central Nebraska, we had wonderfully dark skies. Um, so you could look up in the summertime, and this giant neon cloud would be over. It was the Milky Way. Well, I want to learn constellations. So I learned them from a book, basically. I see, I see. That's now, you, uh, uh, being in Nebraska, you, you were there for, till you went to college? I was there till I left college to go to medical school. I see, I see. Yeah, so I was uh, about 23, 22, 23 when I left Nebraska and went to California, did medical school there. Okay. And um, in the meantime, I'd done a little observing. I'd, cobbled together an old beat-up telescope from the school and I got it to working pretty good with an old dinoscope and the thing was pretty, it was actually a decent scope right. and then I eventually I made a six-inch reflector of my own. I finished out while I was in medical school and did some observing with that but then my profession kind of overtook the life and slowed things down until about uh, just after Y2K mm -hmm. and I was able to start doing some observing again and what really got me going is around 2003 um, we, we'd moved to uh, Florida in 2003, and uh, I met Jose Oliveras, All right. uh, a renowned uh, planetary astronomer. Yeah. And he gave a presentation on the close uh, apparition of Mars that year, which was uh, quite spectacular. And uh, so I'm at this meeting at, a, at a, the local uh, park, and he says, by the way, I'm observing just about every night, so if anybody wants to stop by any time, just stop by. And I'm thinking, oh, pick me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I spent a lot of time over over at his place for the next three years until he passed away in 2006. And he gave me a lot of guidance and really helped me get going. Yeah, he was a friend to a lot of astronomers and uh, a great astronomer himself. So, um, and I know that uh, I mean when I when I met you there, I met you and your wife. I really enjoyed uh, uh, your uh, your you know your character. I I thought that you were. Uh, uh, you know, had a good sense of humor, and I thought that, uh, um, and your wife has a great sense of humor too, you know, so it, that's always nice. And you would have to have a great sense of humor to hang out with people like Tiffy Dioria and Don Parker, you know, who are yeah. cutting it up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. A lot. Of, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, my <laughs> wife and I laugh a lot. I mean, that's that's what keeps us together. Right. If I totally what? understand why you're you, someone like you is so interested in the moon. I keep a I keep a moon globe on my desk all the time. This globe was uh, actually held by Buzz Aldrin. We did like some uh, selfies ah. together, so that's kind of fun. He didn't sign it though, but but still, it was kind of cool just to know it was in his hands. Um, and I've always loved the moon. Um, you know, my first observations through it, my small telescope were, of course, of the moon. 
and uh, the startling effect of seeing uh, craters rise up, you know, against the the background of uh, shadows and all the rest of that. It's just it's mesmerizing, you know. So um, and so and I see that when I look at your images, you know, your the the crisp, uh, you know, stark. Um, relief that you bring out in your images are really amazing. But when did you when did you start taking images of the moon? Well, my first attempt of at an astrophotography was with a little brownie camera that I, on a uh, little mount that I made to try and get the stars, and that was when I was in middle school. Mm -hmm. And I could tell where they are, and I got them developed as though nothing turned out. And I looked at the names. Oh yeah, they did. Obviously, the my mount wasn't very good. Okay, but. I, uh, but so I, I, I did some attempting with that when I was a kid. Then I really didn't start photographing until around 2003. Uh, well, no, it was 2001 is when I started, and I started with imaging the sun. I had an ETX 125 at that point, and I made a or I bought a uh, solar filter for it that screwed into the threads at the front end of the telescope. And actually, there's time I could I'd come home from work to get a quick lunch. It'd take me about five ten minutes to set up, get a picture, and go. And um, so I started doing that, and then it progressed after I met Jose. He encouraged me with stuff, and then uh, that was 2003. Around 2007, 2008, I finally switched over to doing the webcam, digital camera, video thing, and then stacking the images. Mm -hmm. and, um, so it's just something that's progressed. It's something you learn over time, and every year or two, you discover some other, oh, man, that was really stupid. Why did I do that? Right. And so I have a basic, my basic philosophy is you learn by screwing up. And uh, I mean, that's how I asked for. <laughs> I'm still <Yeah>. doing it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm doing it right okay now. <laughs> to, it's okay to screw up if you learn from it. So don't feel bad about that. That's but uh, I've gotten to a place where I'm almost happy with my images, but I call it the artist curse. Oh. No matter how good somebody else thinks it looks, you look at it and it's your work. Oh, I could have done this. Done this. That's right. Yeah. You're right. But that's. And that and just the fascination for what you're seeing. Just, I, I love looking at the moon. Oh, me too. I'm tired of it. Before you get into your presentation, uh, 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 we've got uh, um, some viewers on right now. We have Jerry Hubble, who's, uh, uh, I know he uh, publishes with you in the Association of Lunar yeah. Planetary Observers. Um, and uh, Dusty Haskins, who's also very much into astrophotography. Um, so he's, he's joined us here, and we have a few others that are watching at this time. Um, okay. uh, probably, you know, I, I know you'll probably talk about the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, uh, which you've been very involved with, um, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I guess we'd like to hear, uh, you know, things that inspired you uh, to do the work that you do. You've submitted thousands and thousands of images uh, through ALPO and you have you're being you've been published what in National Geographic um, um, well, I was on the National Geographic website I happened to catch a, a airliner going through the Sun just at the perfect I mean there was a, a video of 900 frames there was three the airliner was visible in four of the frames wow. I picked the best one and I superimposed that on top of the uh, processed image so it lined up exactly how it was when it came through on that one and uh, yeah it was on spaceweather.com and National Geographic picked it up in 2011 they had it on their website that's very cool so that was, that was exciting for me yeah, for a nerd like me to even be that close to National Geographic would be a big deal to me for sure yeah they um, got some stuff. yeah uh, so um, yeah, and uh, you know you've written articles for Sky and Telescope magazine, uh, the Strolling Astronomer. I'm not familiar with the Strolling Astronomer. That's that's the publication for the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. Okay. I see. The Jalpo Journal, so to speak. Got it. Got it. All right. So um, I guess without further ado, I'll let you get into your uh, presentation uh, called "Imagine the Moon." Okay, with. Um, Looking at the moon, you can see it from a distance, but with your imagination, it's almost as if you can reach out and touch it. One morning, a few years ago, when I was still working, uh, I was walking from the parking lot uh, towards the building where I worked, and the moon was at a waning gibbous phase. And in the upper right, there was the dark 
areas of what they call Oceanus Procellarum, that means ocean of storms, and uh, just past that there was a nice bright rim, so it, it uh, went just to that bright, bright rim, but not beyond that. And as noted, it's, oh, that's, it's liberated such and such a way, and it was mostly dark except for some splashes of brilliance where the ray systems from Copernicus, Kepler, Aristarchus were, and it just goes kind of, oh, okay, I can't see the craters, but I know where they are just because of the difference in their brightness. And I was looking up, and a fellow looked at me, and of course, in good nature, he's kind of ribbing me, he says, yeah, still up there. And I thought, yeah, it is. But with a little imagination, it's almost as if you can reach out and touch it. And, uh, you know, you can't help but be amazed when you see the moon. I remember nights camping in Colorado, and looking at the moon and uh, one time we're sleeping outside underneath the stars and my brother's little boy who was four they couldn't get him to shut up it was almost full moon oh look at the moon he's going on and on and on and just just to watch it is amazing um, but the moon kind of gets the short shift from a lot of science and even from uh, public thought because it really hasn't changed much as far as its geography over eons and yet every night it looks different and you can look at the same area several different nights and never get exactly the same view just because of the changes of illumination. And this is something you don't have to have a telescope to see. You can see this very well with the naked eye. And, of course, the most obvious is going through the phases. Uh, it goes from waxing, which on this image is on the right, to, to the fold and into the waning, and to the gibbous. And the waning gibbous has always fascinated me. I mean, most people don't pay attention to it, but one of my earliest memories of the moon was seeing an orange waning gibbous moon coming up over the baseball diamond over a uh, right field fence line. Mm -hmm. uh, and I watched that more than I did the baseball for a while because it just was so spectacular, kind of flat, and it almost looked like a football coming up. But don't tell Charlie Brown that. <laughs> so it goes through the phases. We've got the crescent phase, and it's caused by the... Um, relation to the sun. The moon keeps the same face towards us, but um, different parts of the sun are what I think of as looking, or different parts of the moon are what I think of as looking at different, uh, at the sun. So you've got most of the, uh, on the waxing crescent, most of the moon that we can't see is looking towards the sun. We get to the first quarter, it's as if you can look straight at the moon and stick your arms out right and left and your right arm will be pointing at the sun at the first quarter. Then you get to gibbous, the sun is starting behind us. When you get to full moon, then the sun is directly behind us, illuminating the face of the moon that keeps looking our direction. And then we go to the waning gibbous and the last quarter and the crescent. And it's interesting, too, because these are the obvious changes, but there's some other subtle changes. For instance, the full moon is always opposite the sun, which means when the hot sun is high in the summertime, the full moon tends to be low relative to uh, the wintertime, where in the wintertime the sun is low, but the moon is high. And that's kind of nice, because on a long, dark winter night, it's nice to have that bright moon high up above uh, to kind of carry you through the night when, it, when the moon's visible. Now, the moon keeps the same face towards us, uh, uh, because it's tidally locked and has been for eons, <laughs> but we can kind of see around it. Um, because of what we call libation. No, oops, no, that's not libation, it's libration. Okay. And so, because of the orbital inclination and, and the tilt of the very slight tilt of the rotation axis of the moon, it'll nod, you know, like a head shaking up and down about seven degrees north and south, which is our latitude. And due to changes in orbital speed, you see, the um, moon, like everything else in this uh, solar system, is in an elliptical orbit. So when it's farther away, it slows down. When it's um, closer, it speeds up. Uh, but the rotational speed is always the same, so we get a chance to look right and left of the moon. So we can see, actually, instead of only seeing 50%, if it were in a perfectly circular orbit that was in exact alignment with our polar axis, uh, we can see about 59% of the moon. And it is really fun sometimes to be looking for at the uh, libration zones. You can see stuff that is quite amazing. Now, um, this is a picture I took during the same lunation, and we have the, the, the crescent on the right, the crescent on the left, and if we look right in the middle, I don't know if my cursor will go up there, I guess it will, yeah, can yeah. you see my cursor there? Okay, that's a, a crater named Ptolemaeus, okay, Ptolemaeus right there and right there. Wait a minute, if it's on this side, at, on the right-hand side, if you see that there, 
then uh, it should be invisible on the left-hand side when it's on the other quarter. But no, that's because that right and left wobble of the oh, yeah. moon. Yeah, you can see other features repeated also on the other side too. So. I the Montes, the Alpine Mountains up here. You've got the Archimedes and Aristillus, not Autolycus. All you know these little things down here. It's, it's really neat. And so, but then if you take look at Ptolemaeus, and if on this one back here, you notice that they're pretty much about the same as far as the libration north and south. Okay. Now, if you take, I took another different uh, li um, lunation. And this is the same lunation. Uh, th these two pictures were from the same lunation. But what I did is I joined Ptolemaeus and I overlapped that with Photoshop so they'd be joined together. And when you get, and this is for normal libration, this is what we end up with. Here's Ptolemaeus right here. Oh, wow. That so that, is, that, uh, that's unexpected. I mean, that is really. Um, I had no idea that you could, that the tilt was this much, you know? I mean, when you see it like this, this is really incredible. Yeah, and that's ex exactly the reaction. I, when I put this together and then saw the whole thing, oh my goodness, I mean, exactly the same feeling. Right. Now, it's kind of interesting because a lot of times you don't notice the libration. Now, I'm such a nut about it, I pretty well can feel the librations now when I look because there's a thing called the Western Chain, which is on the eastern side of the moon for reasons I won't go into now. Mm -hmm. um, which I, I look for, and if that's close to the limb, I know that that's librated away. If it's far away from the limb, I know that side is favorable. But one of the things I like to look at on the thing, it says, look at the rim. Well, that's uh, in Imbrium, and then Oceanus Procellarum is the lower left and up towards the tip of the arrow. You see that nice, bright uh, edge around there? That's well, that was actually pointed this way a little bit. Now, a lot of times in librations you'll see the darkness of those uh, areas extend clear to the rim and then you know that the libration is not favorable for that area. And that's, that's something you actually pick up fairly easily when you're looking, when we go for our morning walks and stuff. And I'll point up my wife and she has kind of the same response to my kids, oh cool dad. That, is <laughs> that was a way of being nice and say I've heard enough. <laughs> okay. Aside from the, you know, and I, 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 I certainly uh, call myself a nerd, and some people say that's kind of nerdy, but it is fascinating that you know so much about the moon. I mean, I, I mean, how many features would you say that you know just by looking at the moon what they are, or have you ever counted? Oh, I've never counted, and the heck of it is, I'll look, well, what's that? I can't remember, and then oh, i got to go look it up. Because it's, it's one of those little things. It's like playing a computer game. You know, what's the name of this crater? Right. It's just, it's just a lot of fun. And then um, the other thing that we see that the moon does, and it's kind of rare, is, of course, the lunar eclipse. And I did this. I used uh, Jose Oliveros' 8-inch uh, uh, refractor to do this. Wow. He let me take it home and everything. Wow. And um, um, I'm not a refractor. I'm sorry, 8-inch reflector. Reflector. And uh, so I did... Yeah, and it was, uh, I forget who made that now. He told me who made the mirror. He said it was one of his best mirrors, but it was an excellent telescope. And uh, so I did exposures to show the bright side of the moon as well as the dark side of the moon during the eclipse. And I had a lot of fun putting this together. And this is the first time I'd ever done anything this massive, so it took me about a week to put this together. Now I could do it in a few hours, I think. But it was a learning process, and it just was fun to see the effect on that. Sure. Oops, I went too and here's another eclipse that was done later. Uh, and, uh, there was a, a different eclipse. And uh, again, through, showing through the phases and through the different colors from totality. But it's really amazing. You get that blood moon effect. And I'm not sure exactly how people respond to that, but it just almost seems sinister as you look up, really zero in. Mm -hmm. And the red that's cast on there from the red light making it through the atmosphere and most of the blue light not. So you've got that. Uh, in fact, it looks, <laughs> it give Mars a run for its money. Sure. And it's beautiful. And then the other thing is what the moon effects we see in the tides, uh, you don't even have to look at the moon to see something that the moon is doing. Now, the sun has some effect, but mostly it's the moon, so I'll just go with that, with the tides. And here's an interesting illustration um, of the effect of the tide. Now, this is uh, in an area where there's extreme tidal variation. You go to the Keys, you might get 10 to 12 inches. Now, I remember I chartered a boat in the Keys one time, and he said, be sure to check the tide charts before you go anywhere. So I checked the tide charts. We haven't, uh, I think our maximum tide chart was 11 inches. 
And I looked at my wife. Her, my wife's name is Fairy, by the way, F-A-I-R-Y, just like the tooth fairy. So if I talk about fairy, I'm talking about wife. And she is real. She's not imaginary. <laughs> and uh, and we had a boat in Puget Sound. And we were in Puget Sound. If we had to worry about 11 inches of water, I wouldn't even go in that water. Because our tidal change where we kept our boat was 13 feet. I see. <laughs> so it was quite a deal. By the way, it was her idea to get the boat, so we named it the Ferry Boat. And we had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> so, uh, we had a lot of fun with her name. You, you guys made jokes about, uh, uh, all kinds of jokes about uh, the name Ferry while I was uh, meeting you in oh, Florida. We've got all kinds of stuff. The best one that happened to us is we, were, we had it on the Columbia River for a while, and we locked through John Day Dam, which at the time, or just a few years earlier, had been the highest single lift dam in the world. And so I, I got on the radio, I says, uh, this is the ferry boat, we're about five minutes downstream, would like an upstream lock. He says, oh, just tie up, and when we see you're ready to go, we'll lock you through. So we tied up, nothing happened. Right. Uh, this is the ferry boat, we're ready for, what kind of boat are you? We're, I says, we're a small place craft, our name is the ferry boat. She says, oh, we're looking for a passenger ferry. Right. But they, they, they chuckled about it and locked us through. Right. <laughs> so... Anyway, so with the moon being so visible and all these different changes, it's right. not amazing that... Let, uh, let me ask you that, something. Um, go ahead. Howard, have you... Uh, we got kind of like freeze-framed here on our Skype. Um, uh -huh. Are you... Um, did, have you switched away from the, your slide that shows the low tide and high tide with the moon? Are you on top? I have. Okay. Yeah, and so we're not picking it up right now. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, let's try turning off your video and see if we okay. can with you. This is a signal problem. Okay. Turning off my video. Let's see. I just I did that down. Okay. Now let's see. I need to go over here. So I hit click the thing, turn off video. I think I turned the video off. Okay. I'm frozen up now, it looks like. It does look like you're frozen. Okay, guys. You want me to yeah, so the people that are watching, just stay online with us. We're going to we're going to hang up, but we'll still be connected, okay? And uh, and then we're going to come back on. Uh, we're using Skype to broadcast this, so hang in there with us and we'll be back in a moment. Okay. Okay, here we go. We're gonna try this again. Sorry about this, guys. It happens sometimes. Let me try it one more time. Okay, so, I, I see yeah. you, okay, and we got video, and there you are, and let's go ahead and have you share your screen again. Okay, let's see, that's over here, I think, yeah, share screen, mm -hmm. and hit share, I, I just hit share screen. Yep, yeah. yeah, and you just go ahead and bring your presentation back up full screen. Okay, I'll go ahead and hit that. Let's see, let's get that. Where is it? There it is. I've got the presentation full screen. Hey, okay, there we are. Okay, and then I'll just... Thanks, everybody, for hanging in there with us. <laughs> okay, and so did we see the... Oops, what am I doing here? There we go. Did you see the change? Yes. So we got David looking at the moon? Yes. Okay, so it's easy to imagine that the moon had considerable influence on humanity because um, it has its cycles, it has its uh, different changes in appearance, and you, you can imagine it's had uh, quite a bit of an influence. Um, and even from before David's time, and the statue <laughs> first made him, it's, it's uh, been present. Calendars have been faced, based on the phase of the moon, and many uh, 
many have. Some went by the date of the new moon, which could be guessed, estimated, and then, uh, like the Islamic calendars, are based on the sighting of the phase of the full moon, or of the new moon, rather. Right. So, did some interesting thing. We had some correspondence with uh, people who uh, were wanting to get first views of the newest moon, so we did some efforts and sent, shared some images like that. Mm -hmm. One thing I'll mention, you notice this crescent moon looks like a grin. Yes. Because it's uh, headed, it's in an inclination to orbit where it's headed almost directly towards the sun. Other times it'll be tilted, maybe 45 degrees or more, so it looks like it's almost standing on one end because of the orbital inclination. So it's not always like this. It's fun to interesting, right. or fun to see. And when I was in Tahiti, I'd look at the moon and north, south was up, which really had me scratching my head there for a while. <laughs> so it was kind of fun. Um, but moon has been used to mark holidays and season, like the beginning of Ramadan starts with the crescent moon. Easter. Think about Easter. Why is Easter the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox? Well, when they started figuring out times like that, people didn't have calendars and clocks that worked worth any or anything. So you want to have it on the same day. Okay, it's not too hard to figure out when the equinox is. Everybody knows when the first full moon is, and since they were going to church on Sunday, everybody knew when the Sunday was. So that way they'd have everybody doing the same date, even though the calendars I see. didn't. So the moon uh, fit into that. Yes. Um, and then, of course, vital to our existence uh, has been the harvest and then being able to hunt, you know, the hunter and the gatherer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, growing up on a farm in Nebraska, I really had a, a special appreciation for the importance of the harvest because that, that meant our livelihood for the rest of the year. And if we had a bad harvest, yeah, well, we were living on not much for a while. And then the hunter's moon. And the basic cause of this is because the moon in the summertime is a low latitude. In the wintertime, it's at high latitude, and during the fall, it makes the transition from low to high. So each day, as the moon goes farther along in its cycle, it'll go the same, roughly the same distance in its orbit, but it's inclined at an angle. It parallels the horizon, so it, the, it comes up only just a few minutes later on consecutive days near the full moon in September and October. Uh, so we get that. It's important. And uh, America's first inhabitants, uh, Native Americans, um, had names... Uh, for, different, uh, for the moons. Of course, each tribe had slightly different names, but they talked about the wolf's moon, full moon. You can imagine wolves howling in a cold winter night, just sending chills through your body as well as, as the cold air. And the flower moon of May, you think of it as a time of beginning uh, when new life is coming on. And there was uh, this movie, The Killing of the Flower Moon. To me, I thought that was poetic in that you had, had the uh, Osage people were just coming into being and had a chance to really advance themselves, and it was it was like they were cut off at the very beginning of significant advancement in that movie that we we're talking about. Oh yeah, thunder midsummer living in Nebraska. I knew all about that. And the falling leaves moon, the freezing moon, and the full cold moon. I mean, you know, end of December when it gets really it's really rough. So cold. it marked off the seasons. Okay. I'm sorry. And of course. The moon is thought to affect the mind and the mental process, too. You know, of course, that's where we get the thing named lunacy. Uh, you know, a lot of phrases we use now. Moonstruck, always kind of a moonbeam. We dance by the light of the moon, by the silvery moon. Moonlight and roses. So it is, goes from lunacy to romance, which might not be that big of a step. Yeah, <laughs> I would say that's walking a fine line right there. <laughs> <laughs> So we can see its effect on people, but imagine now for a moment moon's appearance as we see it from Earth. We're looking at that. Yeah. And for a long, long time, people could didn't have telescopes. They could see the dark and bright areas of the moon. You know, and some people think about this when they're looking at some don't. But from a distance, the bright and dark movings are, uh, move, uh, markings are evidence. And there are some fanciful explanations, like uh, they had the lady reading the book. Here's her head. Here's her book. Here's the body. And then here's the flowing um, skirt. And I don't know what they did with Mari Chrissium up here. But anyway, they had the man on the moon, which we talk about. We have the beetle, which uh, different drawings would accentuate the dark areas. And then they had even considered a rabbit. And I'm not sure quite how you get a rabbit out of that, but it was kind of interesting on some of the diagrams. The lady, but if we look at it, lady reading, go ahead. how does that show, show us one more time how that works? Okay, here's the skirt down here, okay. prosolarum. Here's kind of the body and the torso. Here's an arm reaching up to the book, which oh, uh, that must be kind of taught us. And uh, then we've got, oh, wait a minute. 
No, that's Myri Nectaris. And this is you this can't unsee here. that. Once you see it, you can't unsee this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that I'm like the first of them. I was introduced to the rabbit in the moon. And every time I saw it, I was like, okay, there's the, there's the rabbit. But uh, I like this. I like the lady reading a book. It's cool. So it's kind of interesting. So, uh, by the way, just for fun, this insert that was actually a I made a negative of. Jose Oliveras with his folded 10-inch refractor. Oh wow! <laughs> that was just that. Those were special times. Yeah. That's but the closer we get, the the uh, we re get more details and markings, we realize there's significant differences between the dark areas and the bright areas. And uh, in the past, they called the dark areas the mare, or it looks like mare, but that's a horse. Uh, the mare, which is seas, and then the lands, the terra. And it's kind of interesting. This Ptolemaeus, remember I was talking about Ptolemaeus where he joined that? Yeah. He, he was uh, put on a solid ground of this, the Terra, the highlands, by, by, the name, by the people that named it, whereas Copernicus, um, uh, Kepler, Aristarchus, Eratosthenes, they were cast into the Sea of Storms for their heretical uh, views of... Uh, wow. G, uh, sun, sun uh, or heliocentric solar system. And just for whatever, uh, this little dark area here, that's the uh, Riccioli, that marks the crater. And then this is actually a crater, a small impact basin, Grimaldi. Grimaldi did the work of, of doing a detailed map on the moon, and then uh, Riccioli, who was kind of his superior, labeled it and sent it off. And that's most, uh, I, I don't know, it's like 60, 70% of the names on the moon now are, are names that was given by Riccioli based on Grimaldi's work. But it was kind of interesting. This is very interesting. But, but this is just basically, it, it's mare, mare, it's not mare, it's okay. mare, this is mare chrysium, and mul plural is maria, not maria. So anyway, just look. <laughs> but we'll, we'll notice two characteristics. Uh, they're dark, Yeah. they're relatively smooth, and they have very few craters on them. So you got mare imbrium, which is kind of north central, you got mare chrysium, yeah. And then you've got several. You've got Serenitatis, Tranquillitatis, Apollo landed kind of down over this area, Apollo 11. And then up here in the Taurus Littrell Valley uh, was the last one, Apollo 17. And um, then we've got the Oceanus Procellarum, or this ocean of storms. It's kind of interesting. Um, um, Gene Cernan yeah. and Harrison Schmidt landed here on Apollo 17. And uh, I, always, I always like to throw this out. Uh, Gene Cernan was the 11th person to step foot on the moon, and Harrison Schmidt was the 12th person to step foot on the moon. But Gene Cernan is considered the last man on the moon. Hmm. Because he was the last to step off of the moon, back onto the I see. lander. Got it. <laughs> but anyway, that's kind of a fun little thing to throw in there. And the ages, I won't go into details on that other than it was because of Apollo specimens, the ages of these maria, uh, the impact basins that cause these depressions are probably greater than 3.85 billion years. Now some of the flows may be 2 to 3 billion years old, they're very old, mm -hmm. uh, with exceptions. There's a little crater up here called Lichtenberg, which has part of its rays covered by lava flows, so even as, as late as maybe a billion years ago there was still lava activity, but most of this has been dead as far as geologic activity for a very long time. Are there, what did I do? Howard, are there, is there any, I, I hear about moonquakes and this kind of thing, and is there, is there anything to that? There are some very light moonquakes, most of them are probably from small impacts. They generated some moon, uh, moonquakes by intentionally crashing things into the moon, such as the uh, lunar, uh, the lander after they'd gotten the astronauts out of it, they'd, they'd crash it back in. Mm -hmm. And then thermal contraction is very slowly uh, cooling down. There's some faults have been discovered that are associated with the, the surface of the moon uh, contracting because it's shrinking because it's getting colder with time. But it's not real active. But when you do get a, get a significant tremor like an impact with an object, it, they say it rings like a bell and that can go on for a long, you know, I think an hour or two or something. They can detect waves going through it, which is... Which is really curious. Mm -hmm. And these basically there's a lava filled depressions which were caused uh, by impacts. And here's a picture. I this I got this about two and a half weeks ago. Um, where the arrows are, uh -huh. it was just right on Mari Imbrium to show the uh, lava 
flow. And that lava flow is about, gee, many, I think it's, what is it, uh, about 110 miles or so, what, what you can see here. So that was a long flow. And based on the samples brought back, they feel that the lava, when it was molten and flowing, had the same viscosity as warm motor oil. Wow. It's not the stuff like you're saying not coming out of Kilauea, which still is fairly fairly thin as far as viscosity. This was really thin, so you get these flat layers like that. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you look at the lunar highlands, <clears throat> you notice that it's bright, um, and so it's different, and it's most notable in the southern moon, although up around the squirrel's nest, uh, there's some bright areas, and in the northern part of the moon, you can see that as well. Right. <laughs> and when you look at that, as opposed to the Maria, they're very heavily cratered, to the point where just about every crater you see obliterated some other crater when it was formed. Sure. And uh, and the other thing is it's higher in elevation than the Maria, which makes sense because uh, the lava flow would be in the lower areas. It'd be easier to get through. Um, in the moon, some are, most of these craters are very old, although Tycho is, they think, is 108 million years old. I would really love to see some other data on Tycho because this is based on some what they think was ray material from Tycho at the Apollo 17 landing site, which is a long way away. So was that really sampling Tycho or was it not? They think maybe it was, and based on, there's other ways to date this, what they call um, um, crater counts. Small, tiny crater counts uh, can give an estimate of the age, so it's probably around 108 million years old. But Clavius down here, that's this crater, this big crater, which has all the other yeah. dents in it. Right. That's probably over four billion, probably around four billion years old. And most of these craters you see here are probably approaching four billion years old or older. So that's kind of a curious thing. And Craton was formed by asteroid or cometary impacts, mostly asteroid impacts. And um, um, they ate. Is that the difference between a comet impact and an asteroid impact? Well, there's some that have crater chains, and comets, uh, if they're a dirty snowball or a snowy dirt ball, which <laughs> kind of describes them, a lot of those would break up, so you'd probably have a crater chain rather than a solid impact. I because see. gravitational... Yeah, you do see, fun. like, uh, multiple... It does look like many... Uh, uh, like, a, like a machine gun effect or something, you know, hitting... The, it hitting would be, yeah. Right. Although... These are secondary craters that were thrown out of Copernicus here. And you see Copernicus, it's got bright, it's got rays and stuff, which we'll look at in a minute. And Eratosthenes is similar, but it's a little bit tired and older. And then poor Stadius has been buried, battered, and then spat upon by secondary craters from oh, uh, a long time. <laughs> yeah, from Copernicus. So, But Copernicus looks like a fresh young crater, but their best guess is 800 million years old. And this is based on data from Apollo 14, who landed in the Fra Mauro area, just just south of this, just a little way. So they're pretty. It's it's likely that's a, a, a valid sampling. That's where Apollo 13 was supposed to have gone. Right. By the way, do you know which who holds the world's record and the farthest anyone has ever been from Earth? Uh, Jim Lovell. It'd be Apollo 13. He loved, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Apollo 13 because they had the return trajectory, so they didn't descend into lunar orbit. They went past and then came back. So. And that's a record I suspect is going to be for a while, but somewhere somewhere along the line we'll break that. Hey, we've got a question from one of the people watching, uh, Mr. Dennis Hess. He says, so why does the surface area of, of Mare uh, appear to be so smooth as compared to the rest of the surface of the moon? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, um, because the rest of the surface of the moon was in existence before the Maria, and the areas of the Maria probably looked like the highlands, but then we had these giant impacts came in, and uh, they uh, obliterated those craters, and then after that, the cratering rate had gone down tremendously. The first half a billion years of the Earth and Moon's existence, these things were really getting clobbered, and then uh, they had some heavy cratering, which some people refer to as a late heavy bombardment. Now, there's discussion if that really happened or if it's just it was just a mixture that ended up looking like that. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, there were some large impactors that came in um, and obliterated those. And then those areas filled up with the Mar Mari lava. And so it just those other craters were like, the Maria was like the highlands, but it got obliterated and then filled in by lava. And then by that time, the cratering rate had vastly decreased. 
Mm. But that's a, that's a great observation. It's and uh, a great question. And one of the things you can see from young craters less than a billion years old. Okay, young craters less than a billion years old. I can understand yeah, right. when you're 65 years old thinking that 65 is young. But even at my age, I can't imagine a billion years being young. Right. But anyway, examples are Copernicus, Kepler, and then I didn't label it up here, but this is Aristarchus up here. And you see the ray areas around them. Right. It's interesting. Uh, if, any, if you look, get to looking at pictures of Mercury from the Messenger spacecraft, you'll find a crater on Mercury that looks very, very similar to Kepler. In fact, mm -hmm. I, I don't have it on here, but I, I did a side-by-side -side juxtaposition. It's got kind of this little, spic go, it's got little spicule going up this way. It's got these here, and it's got this round thing. But if you put them side-by-side, -side, I'd have to look twice to say, which one's Mercury and which one's Moon? Yeah, the first time I saw an image of the surface of Mercury, I did think I thought initially I was looking at the moon, but I, of course it's it's different. Yeah, and so the raid craters; these are the young craters. When you look at it, there's really not that many raid craters. So in the last billion uh, last billion years, there's not been a lot when you consider, uh, you know, forty fifty craters that are there on this picture. And here's here's what it looked like without the moon. So it's kind of fun to oh. compare. Right. On that. But those are black, bright splashes of material. And if you have, if you were to dig underneath the lunar soil and spoil it out, it would be bright like these rays and then it would darken with time due to space weathering that would be caused by cosmic radiation, by solar flares, uh, uh, solar particle events. And um, basically, a lot of it is just based, you have iron oxide. And the iron oxide is actually brighter than iron. And it'll hit there, it'll knock the, uh, a ray or a a cosmic particle will hit there, hit a molecule, and, and uh, knock the oxygen off, and it may either just go as a gas and escape, or it may combine with hydrogen coming from the solar wind to perform some water, which rapidly dissipates and leaves behind what they call nanophase iron, which is basically elemental iron. And they call it nanophase because it's about the size of bacteria, but over a period of time, that gets darker and darker as that appears. I see. So if you were standing on the moon, Let's just say that you could you could survive this somehow, okay? Yeah. And you saw an impact happen. Now, being that there's no atmosphere, what are we going to what are we going to witness? Is there going to be like raining molten uh, oh. lava rock coming down in all directions? I mean, what what the, is it? Just a is it a sideways blast that that's happening? What what's the dynamics of uh, yeah of all of the above? Like this? Yeah, contact phase when the when the thing gets and you get severe quick compression uh, of both the ground and the area there, and it you're talking about things that are landing anywhere from four to fifteen miles per second speed. At that, the kinetic energy that having to stop so quick is equivalent to their weight in TNT as an explosive thing. And that's why you get these these explosions like that. They're so massive. You get the it'll excavate a crater and it'll shoot the rays out. It'll shoot various particles out. You'll get some rebound from the inside, and the bottom that comes up will cause these little mountains in the middle for central peaks if they're big enough. And you can see the central peak in Eratosthenes. You get some ground settling afterwards. We'll get these terraces, but all this stuff is ejected. The high energy, uh, uh, higher the energy, the farther they'll go. But uh, some of these have gone like hundreds of kilometers. The rays that come out of there. Yeah. And you've got the lower energy fills this eject continuous ejecta zone, which is all stuff that's thrown out of the crater. It goes usually goes out about the width, about a crater diameter from from the crater. Then you've got the discontinuous ejecta coming out here, and these these are secondary craters from some of that. Uh, it, the dynamics would be very hard to tell, predict which way it would go. Uh, but nevertheless, this all happens in minutes or in in a, just a minute or two. So you'd be if you were standing, there, you'd want to be a long way away because there'd be this cloud of stuff flying out. Then you have boulders flying your way. A lot of the rays actually have small rocks that landed with them. Um, and uh, you would not want to be in here because you would be basically buried and obliviated. And then on top of this, basically the equivalent mass of the impactor is liquefied. So you have impact melt, which forms this floor in here, but also around this area, it'll, it'll cause that. Right. And Tycho has a very nice... Uh, area of impact melt around it that darkens that area just right immediately around the crater. So it'd be a catastrophic. Plus, 
if you were on Earth and saw this happen, you better be get, get ready for a meteor storm. It's going to be pretty spectacular, and hope some of them aren't big enough to do some damage. Now, has this, so, has anyone, I mean, at any time in recorded history, witnessed a meteor impact or a comet impact on the moon? That's a good question. Now, as far as recording impacts, now that we have the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, they are seeing some impacts. They'll discover craters that were not there two or three years ago. But these are craters on the order of 10 to 15 meters. They're not miles in diameter like this. There was one, I, I can't remember who they were, but there was uh, in uh, a few hundred years ago, uh, three people were observing the moon, and they saw a bright area on the moon uh, that they swore was very bright. And they thought it was, and that's been argued that that was an impact. However, there's no, in the area they saw it, there aren't any really good crater candidates for a new impact. And plus, if that happened, usually within a short period of time, there would have been a meteor shower that would have been very noticeable after that from eject, stuff ejected that was captured and then plunged into Earth. Okay. So there's, it's been argued that there was, but uh, not that's, that, not that's been proven, other than the very small meteoroid impacts by, noted by the lunar reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. recon Orbiter. So, uh, and like I say, most of the lunar craters of, uh, on the highlands, most of these have all faded. These are probably on the order, like I say, about four billion years old. So, just imagine when you look at the moon, you see these dark areas. And this is going back to the question that was asked the Mario were once like highlands, but what happened? And then clues, Chrysium looks round, Serenitatis, Tranquilitatis have kind of a round Im impression, and Nectaris, you don't see it very well in here because there's lots of rays crossing it, but it, it's, it's round. Imbrium is quite round. You've got the arc of the Apennine Mountains here. Um, these, were, so these were caused by huge impacts. It basically erased this type of material was over here. It erased that. It just obliviated it. And then it was filled in by lava, so you don't see it. And then later on, these other craters impacted and splattered there, but there weren't very many of them that did that. Right. So what we're looking at, if you think about when you look and see the moon in the evening, um, you see the dark areas, you're looking about, about 4 billion years ago and before, the moon was heavily cratered. So the moon was formed probably about um, 4.5 billion years ago, 4.4, not 4.4 billion years, somewhere in that area, we think. So the first four, almost half a billion years, this was like a shooting gallery. You had all this stuff coming yeah. in. Yeah. And then yeah. around four billion years ago and maybe before that, but then later we had some of the impacts. And this probably, its impact was probably about 3.85 billion years ago that caused this. And there's one other you can't see over here called Mare Orientale. Um, and that's the youngest impact based on the moon. Boy, if, if that were turned towards Earth, it would look like a giant eye looking at us. And can you imagine the legends and the tales and the yeah. theology that would be associated with that. Sure. So they came in, there were huge impacts, destroyed the other, left the lowlands filled with lava, and then after things dropped off. So the southern highlands, you think about that four billion years old or uh, thereabouts, mm -hmm. or the Maria, 3.8 billion years old with lava flows that are younger than that with the basic thing. And then since that time, not a lot has happened. Not a lot has happened. So, but the Earth must have been getting battered like that too. So, you know. Absolutely, the Earth certainly was. And what's really unique about the Moon, we think nothing happens there, but it's a record of what has happened there that's been used almost like a Rosetta Stone to unlock the secrets of what's happened in Mercury, what's happened in what we can determine on the craters of Venus, yeah. Mars, and all that type of stuff. Sure. Earth we're unique because we have the plate tectonics, we have erosion, we have weather that, that effectively erase most of these. But with certain uh, things, um, with looking in a satellite imagery, we're discovering a lot of craters uh, that weren't, that somehow survived. Even in Utah, there was a thing called Upheaval Dome. And it was a large impact crater, but first, nobody knew for sure what caused it. Well, maybe it was part associated with a salt uh, dome that had the intrusion. Then they got to looking into the ground and they have what they call shatter cones, mm -hmm. which the force the impact compresses the uh, ground into cones and they discovered that really is an impact base. Even though you can't see the crater, it's the remnants on there. So Earth got battered just like the moon. And it's kind of interesting because one of the last craters to be formed on the moon that was huge was Tycho, maybe 1.8 million years ago. Okay. 
and it's probably the only crater, big crater on the moon that formed when there was eyes on Earth to actually see it happen. But it wasn't our eyes, it was somebody else. And so I say, how long ago was it that the last feature, well, it was associated with the dinosaurs. So, and, is, so was there a group of, uh, I think in our conversation with Steve Edberg a few days ago, we talked about this. Uh, is there any, anything to it that perhaps uh, 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 that crater is associated with the uh, so-called Death Star of, of the uh, dinosaur age? Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a good question on that. Um, at one point, there's a thing called the Baptistina group of, di of uh, asteroids, uh, which there was a larger body that suffered an impact that shattered that, and then it eventually sent uh, asteroids into the inner solar system where they could impact. And they thought that this very well might be because the age 108, 1.8 million, or I'm sorry, uh, 108 million years ago versus 65 million years ago, the timing could be spread over that amount of time. Then they since have discovered that, uh, oops, it wasn't 160 years, uh, 160 million years ago that the Baptist, Baptistina for, group was formed. It was probably more like about 80 million years ago, so probably not. And 80 million years ago, it would be difficult after an impact like that for an impactor to cause the impact that eliminated the dinosaurs from that. But there's other groups of asteroids, so they may have been from another family, perhaps what they call the flora family. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, 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 it's uncertain. But it's quite possible that they could be related. However, regardless of whether they're related or not, it certainly was a warning shot that foreshadowed the disaster that could happen and made it possible for us to, uh, for mammals to uh, exist and for the rise of our very own existence. Sure, sure. I feel kind of intimately entwined with the moon just, just from that thought. Mm -hmm. now, now, the other... Our, Go ahead. We've run into another scenario where the video is now frozen. We probably can't see any more of your slides. Um, okay. Just going to let. Well, you we're just and, and we're practicing it. And um, I would just add one thing. Um, this is a foreshadowing. So the moon has interacted with us um, from day to day and in uh, ancient times. Even seventeen thousand years ago, we found calendars on cave art and uh, petroglyphs of how people base their time and life on the moon, and yet the moon bears imprints that foreshadowed our coming existence. So it's like we're bound together. And I like to say, I cast my gaze upon the sky to see what I could see, on, upon the moon to see what I could see, and the more that I looked, the more I saw. There was so much more to see. No. It's not a event that done that. It's a continuing recurrence of a wonderful place to visit. I just love it. That's awesome. Well, that's, that's an incredible, it was a great lecture. We had uh, many people chime in saying, uh, you know, uh, uh, how great the presentation was. There is another question from Dennis Hess. Uh, he says, is there any evidence that the moon is currently geologically active in any manner? That's a real good question. The official answer is no, but uh, it is active in that there is shrinkage as it cools so there's some craters that have formed, and actually in the Apollo 17 landing area, there's some, uh, the, the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has shown some stuff, mm -hmm. and there's some suspicious areas. There's uh, uh, on the south west, uh, east portion of Mare Imbrium, on the other side of the uh, Apennine Mountains, away from the actual Mare itself, there's a thing called Aina Crater. And when you look at Aina Crater, it's a strange little thing. It's very difficult to see through a telescope. I've imaged it a couple times, but it's a very difficult object. It looks like a dark D, uh, backwards D, I mean a capital D. And uh, when you look at that very close, there's things that don't make sense on its, uh, in its makeup. And it looks like there could have been possibly venting, possibly outgassing, maybe as early as less than a million years ago, or maybe even sooner than that. So it's possible there might be some venting and outgassing coming from that. Mm. Aristarchus Plateau um, is another area that they've had uh, sightings that they, at times they wonder if something could happen. And when the Apollo missions went around there, they detected increased uh, levels of radon at different passes over there. So there probably is some venting of gases from the inside but as far as active volcanoes at the time or uh, tectonics like we have on Earth. Those are not present. Mm. That's great. So. Um 
I guess we're heading up towards the end of our program here, Howard. Um, is there, for people that want to get involved in uh, learning about the moon in the way that you have, in contributing to um, you know, ongoing uh, research on the moon that's done by amateur astronomers, what, do you, what kind of recommendations do you make? Um, I would say if you're interested in the moon, use whatever resources you have. How big a telescope do you, know, have, do you need? I don't know. How big a telescope you got? Tycho made major discoveries with just a tiny little telescope, and you can have a lot of fun with that. Don't have a telescope and don't want to buy one? There's a thing called uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Quick Map. You can just Google Quick Map. Uh, you can Google LROC Quick Map, and that'll get you to that. And it's got a map made of images from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. You can see it, the moon uh, just as a whole moon, or you can zero in to stuff that's not quite the resolution that's good enough to be able to see the lunar landers on the surface, but it's very close. Mm -hmm. And what's really neat about that is it's got a little tool you can use, and you can run it. It'll be a, a measurement tool. You click on one side, run it to the other side, click the other side, and it'll give you the distance, plus it'll give you the elevation relative to the mean elevation of the surface of the moon. Oh, wow. And with that, you can make measurements of crater diameters, crater depths. If you want to measure how far things have... Uh, are apart, you can measure that, but it gives you a profile. It's, I've used many of those things to make measurements that I've, I've submitted for publications. And it's free to anybody that wants to take it. It's just a site that's associated, it's a NASA JPL site. That's true. And I guess if you wanted to, once the libraries open up again, there are libraries that have uh, 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 telescopes that you can check out. Um, and astronomy clubs, you know, they often have yeah. equipment they can loan out and that kind of thing. So eventually we'll all be out uh, observing uh, together, uh, you know, in groups. Um, but uh, that's a subject uh, for another show. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I can already tell that there, there is, you know, we just kind of scraped a little tip of the... Uh, of, of, the, of the of the crater mountains here, because <laughs> I don't want to say icebergs yeah. here. Although there is ice on on the moon, so yeah. um, there's yeah. a lot more to learn, and you're the guy to uh, to learn it from. So uh, hopefully you'll uh, come back on another show with us, Howard. And uh, I've got lots of ideas of things we could do. Okay, all right, so that's great. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, take care. Uh, we will. Uh, We'll uh, uh, come back with more programming. We've got um, uh, a program tomorrow about the Cherry Springs Star Party. So, uh, so if you're uh, so inclined to uh, learn more about uh, some of the big star parties that are affected by the coronavirus uh, problem, you might want to tune in tomorrow. I'll give uh, a notification, and until then, keep looking up. <laughs>